The Bible passage for today is from Joshua chapter 22. That's Joshua 22. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have done all that Moses, the servant of God, commanded, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, you have not deserted your brothers, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Now that the Lord your God has given your brothers rest, as he promised, return to your homes in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But be very careful to keep the commandments and the law that, the, that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to obey his commands, to hold fast to him, and serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Then Joshua blessed them and sent them on their way, and they went to their homes. To the half-tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given the land in Bashan, and to the other half of the tribe, Joshua gave land on the west side of the Jordan with their brothers. When Joshua sent them home, he blessed them, saying, Return to your homes with your great wealth, with large herds of livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and a great quantity of clothing, and divide with your brothers the plunder from your enemies. So the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites at Shiloh in Canaan to return to Gilead, their own land, which they had required in accordance with the command of the Lord through Moses. When they came to Gelioth, near the Jordan, in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an imposing altar there by the Jordan. And And when the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border of Canaan at Gelioth, near the Jordan, on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. So the Israelites sent Phinehas, uh, son of Eleazar, the priest of the, to the land of Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. With them, they sent ten of the chief men, one for each of the tribes of Israel, each the head of a family division among the Israelite clans. Then, when they came to Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they said to them, The whole assembly of the Lord says, How could you break faith with the God of Israel like this? How could you turn away from the Lord and build yourselves an altar in rebellion against him now? Was not the sin of Peor enough for us? Up to this very day we have not cleansed ourselves from that sin, even though a plague fell on the community of the Lord. And are you now turning away from the Lord? If you rebel against the Lord today, tomorrow he will be angry with the whole community of Israel. If the land you possess is defiled, come over to the Lord's land, where the Lord's tabernacle stands and share the land with us. But do not rebel against the Lord or against us by building an altar for yourself, other than the altar of the Lord our God. When Ashan, son of Zerah, acted unfaithfully, Regarding the devoted things, did not wrath come upon the whole community of Israel? He was not the only one who died for his sin. Then Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh replied to the heads of the clan of Israel, The mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows, and let Israel know. If this has been in rebellion or disobedience to the Lord, do not spare us this day. If we have built our own altar to turn away from the Lord and to offer burnt offerings and grain offerings or to sacrifice fellowship offerings on it, may the Lord God himself call us to account. No, we did it for the fear that someday your descendants might say to ours, what do you have to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? Then the Lord made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, You Reubenites and Gadites, you have no share in the Lord. 
so your descendants might cause ours to stop fearing the Lord. This is why we said, let us get ready and build an altar, but not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. On the contrary, it is to be a witness between us and you and the generations that follow that we will worship the Lord at his sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifices and fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share in the Lord. And we said, if they ever, if they ever say this to us, to our descendants, we will answer, look at the replica of the Lord's altar, which our fathers built, not for burnt offerings and sacrifices, but as a witness for uh, between us and you. Far be it from us to rebel against the Lord and turn away from him today by buildings and uh, building an offering, uh, an altar for burnt offerings, grain offerings and sacrifices, other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before his tabernacle. When Phineas the priest and the leaders of the community, the heads of the clans of the Israelite, heard what Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, Manasseh had to say, they were pleased, and Phineas, the son of El- Eleazar, the priest, said to Reuben, Gad, and, the, and Masana, Manasseh, today we know that the Lord is with us because you have not acted unfaithfully towards the Lord in this matter. Now you have rescued the Israelites from the Lord's hand. Then Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and the leaders returned to Canaan, from their, me- from their meeting with the Reubenites and the Gadites in Gilead and reported to the Israelites. They were glad to hear the report and praise God. And when they talked no more about going to war against them to devastate the country where the Reubenites and the Gadites live, and the Reubenites and the Gadites gave the altar this name, a witness between us and the Lord is God. This is God's word. Let's pray. We confess that sometimes as we read through the Old Testament, we may not always find it as compelling as parts of the New Testament or other parts of the Bible, and yet it's your word, all of it. And while we are so far removed from the nation Israel, nevertheless, We are part of your kingdom. We are part of your people as they are. And we will all be together one day in your kingdom. So we pray that you would help this account of this matter between the Reubenites and the rest of the nation will not cause us to simply allow the word to go over us but not in us, to hear but not to listen. We pray that you would help us to see how this story has relevance for us. And we pray that you would burn it upon our hearts. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that we would come away from here this evening, not only having a greater grasp of your word, but by having an encounter with the living God. For Jesus' sake, amen. Two men lived in a small village, got into a terrible dispute they could not resolve. So they decided to take their dispute to the town sage, to the wise man. The first man went to the sage's home and told his version of what happened. When he finished, the sage said, you're absolutely right. The next night, the second man called on the sage and told his side of the story. The sage responded, you're absolutely right. After the sage's wife scolded her husband, these men told you two different stories, and you told them that they were both absolutely right. That's impossible. 
They can't both absolutely, absolutely be right. One must be right and one must be wrong. And the sage turned to his wife and said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> now the reality is, you know, we smile at that, is that conflict's not easy, is it? When we've got conflict with someone, it's hard to know sometimes how to address that conflict. And sometimes conflict goes unaddressed. Sometimes we just bury it deep down in our soul. And it stays there and it begins to fester. And it begins to cause us to have different attitudes towards the person that maybe we're in conflict with. And we push it out at arm's length because confrontation is not easy. I mean, who likes uh, confronting people when there's conflict? No one likes doing that. I at times it can, be, it can end up very, in, in unfortunate ways, it can actually heighten the conflict. Other times it might get resolved. But, but none of us like having to deal with conflict. And yet Scripture says in order for the unity of the church to remain intact, it's necessary that we deal with conflict that arises. And conflict can come in so many different scenarios. There may be personal conflict between people, where there have been things said that have hurt the other person. Or maybe there have just been different viewpoints that we have on, on how ministry should occur. And those different viewpoints are at polar opposite ends. And we get into a, a fight with each other. Maybe it has to do with things like songs that we sing, music. And in the 80s, particularly, and I was a teenager in the 80s, the conflict wars of music was at its height. And many people left the church as a result of some of those conflicts and never dealt with it because conflict is not easy. And yet what this account reminds us of is that in order for the unity of God's people to remain intact, it's necessary that we deal with these things and not simply because it's too hard, try and sweep them under the carpet and pretend that it doesn't matter. And if you would extend that out even further in the Christian world, what about conflict between parents and children, grown-up adult children? Sometimes in the ministry that I, God has so graciously enabled me to exercise, I've dealt with parents with tears running down their face because they're in a conflicted situation with a son or a daughter. And it seems like that situation is just never going to resolve. At least within the Christian community, we have a way in which we can deal with this. Number one, I want you to notice Firstly, the reason for conflict, verses 1 to 10. I'm not going to reread the verses for the sake of time. The reason for conflict. Now, what's really interesting initially in this account is that these tribes are commended by Moses. Not Moses, uh, Moses and, and Joshua. They commended. They told, you've done everything that is required of you. If you remember the story... When they came to the promised land, on the east side, these two, tri two and a half tribes, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, said, can we remain on this side, the tribe of Joseph ultimately, can we remain on this side of the Jordan River? Because we really like the land here, it's fertile, and we want to settle here, it'll suit us for our farming activities. And Moses' re reply to them was, yes, you can stay here on one condition. That when your brothers go into the promised land and they seek to conquer the nations there, that you must go with them and you must fight on their behalf and you must fight for as long as it takes for the land to be subdued. Only when the entire land has been subdued can you withdraw back to this eastern side of the river and can you settle there. Now what happens here is they have fulfilled their obligations. So they are commended for that. They have left no stone unturned. They have fulfilled the vows, the promises they made to God. And therein lies a very important reminder for us that when we make vows to God and we make promises to Him, we should endeavor to keep those promises. 
Don't make promises to God that you can't keep. Sometimes in a rash moment, we, we might make vows to God that we find difficult to keep. Who can remember a story in Judges of a man who made a very rash jow, a vow to God? Jephthah. Remember Jephthah's story? He said, well, Lord, if you give me victory in this battle that I'm going to engage in, then I will sacrifice the very first thing I see when I return from battle. And he returns from battle, and the first thing he sees is his daughter come dancing down towards him. And she says, can I mourn? Give me 30 days because I'm going to die. And he sacrifices. No, he should have never sacrificed her. He should have broken the vow. But nevertheless, James reminds us in chapter 5, verse 12, he makes this simple statement. Above all, my brothers, do not swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you will be condemned. In other words, don't make rash vows. Make sure that when you make vows before God and you commit yourself before Him, you fulfill those vows. And we fulfill them by enabling or by drawing on the grace of God who enables us to do that. And so they're commended by that. And I would say there are some of you sitting here this, this, this evening who have made vows to serve God and you have faithfully fulfilled those vows. You are still serving God. You are still honoring your commitment to Him. You are still going from strength to strength in serving God. And so you can know that God is pleased with your service. And God commends you for your fulfillment of those vows, fulfillment of those commitments, for your ongoing service. Don't give up. Keep going. The, then he says they, he instructed them to be totally committed to the Lord, and they've done that. Love the Lord your God. We could spend a whole sermon here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and make sure that that results in service. And they've done that. They've loved God in that way. They fulfilled that command that has been given to them. And the evidence has been the way in which they have faithfully gone ahead with the rest of the tribes into the land, and they have demonstrated that theirs isn't just a lip service to God, but it's actual action. Because it's so easy at one level for all of us, including myself, to give lip service to God, but never to follow through with that in action. We say we love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But sometimes the way we live betrays what our statements say. And sometimes it affirms what our statements say. And sometimes that love of God that I've seen evident in the church, in this church, has been tremendous to see how people have applied God's command to love Him with all their heart, soul, and mind, and have engaged in service, and have demonstrated in a very practical means the way in which they are applying that command. And the reason it's so important, you see, my dear friends, and you know this, is because our actions towards each other need to be undergirded by our love for God. Because if we simply do what we do because we've been commanded to do it, that's simply legalism. And there is no life in legalism. There's no joy in a bunch of obeying, trying to obey a bunch of rules, none whatsoever. There's only burden there, and there's only slavery. But when we love God, and the love for God that we have then begins to overflow in our hearts and begins to get extended out towards others, then we are serving for the right reasons. Then our motivations are right. And then we will find joy in service. And then service won't be a bind, and it won't be something difficult, and we won't constantly sigh, thinking, oh, I've got to go and do X, Y, and Z. It will simply be an expression of our love for God. So you can see why it's so important that we love God. How do we love God? How do we gain, how do we grow in our love for God? By spending time with God, by taking time out in His Word, and let me say this, by praying and asking that God would enable us to grasp 
more deeply His great love. It's key to your Christian maturity. The reason that some of us have such uh, difficult Christian walk or, or it's almost a burden to be a Christian is because we haven't grasped how much God loves us. If you are ever going to grow as a Christian, you have to grow in your understanding of how much God loves you. It's key to your maturity. It's key to your joy. It's key to your fulfillment. That's why it's so, so very important. And Moses commends them for that. So can I encourage you? When you're in your prayer time, get down on your knees and say, God, please, please, show me how much you love me. It'll transform you. Trust me, it will. So having done all of this, you can imagine now the difficulty. If they've been following God, obeying God, loving God, serving their fellow man by being involved in the conquering of the land, what's going on with this altar? Deuteronomy 12 verse 5 makes this simple statement. But you are to seek the place of Yahweh your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. There is only one altar they are to go to, and that is the altar that God determines, and that's the other side of the Jordan. So what on earth is going on? This tribe seems to be doing all the right things, and now suddenly there seems to be this glaring mark of disobedience. This glaring mark of, of building an altar on the wrong side of the river. And so you can understand the concern of the other tribes. And you can understand why now this conflict has arisen. The reason behind it is a misperception. But nevertheless, even our misperceptions are sometimes the same as reality. And this is what's happened. They perceive unfaithfulness in these tribes. And they prepare to do something about it. They prepare to go to war. And so they summon them, prepare for war. And there again is some, I think, practical application here for us. Even if there are misperceptions, we should be concerned for God's faithfulness to be exhibited in God's people. And where we perceive perhaps there to be unfaithfulness, it ought to be something we follow through with. And even if that is exposed not to be unfaithfulness, it's important that we don't just leave it there. So let me give you a really practical way that this sometimes can happen. We have groups of people that follow up on those who, for whatever reason, are unable to make church. Now, we don't know why they can't come to church. It may be because they're sick, they're unwell. It may be because they're away on holiday. And sometimes you may go into a phone call thinking, you know, they're just being disobedient by not coming to church, when in fact it's got nothing to do with that. And you phone and you find out, in fact, they're unwell. Or they've been away on holiday. But it's important that we... Make those phone calls because we should love one another enough to care for our spiritual well-being. Secondly, I want you to notice the confrontation of the conflict, verses 11 to 20. The confrontation of the conflict. This is perceived as, as so serious that what they do is they say, let's get ready for war. Now, you might say, isn't that a bit of an overreaction? At one level, yes. At another level, no. If their perception is correct, which we know it isn't, but let's assume for a moment it is correct. Why is there so much concern for them over what is perceived as disobedience from those tribes? Well, the hints are given in the text, at least two. The one is because of what happened at Baal of Peor. You remember Numbers chapter 25. If you're familiar with your Bible, you'll know the story. 
Numbers chapter 25, when the Israelites are in the wilderness, in their wilderness wanderings, what happens is the, the people get seduced by the Moabite women, the men. And they start bringing these Moabite women back into the community and having sexual relations with them. And as a result of that, they get led astray into idolatry. And they begin worshiping Baal of Peor. And God is displeased with this. And so the whole community is called to, to come before God. And God calls Moses into the tabernacle and, and expresses his, dis, his displeasure with it. And in the midst of his displeasure, a, a, a God begins to inflict them with disease. And people begin to die as a result of this rebellion. And then one of the Israelite men bring a Moabite woman right back into the camp. And in front, while this is happening, he sleeps, he begins, engages in a sexual relationship. And Phineas, he gets up and he sees this, he grabs his spear, and he goes and he plunges it through them in the midst of their sexual relationship. And the plague stops. 24,000 are dead. 24,000. Now you can understand. They, they say if, if this tribe is sinning against God, it affects the entire community. It's never done in isolation. And it's the same within a church where there is sin that is undealt with in a church. It never just affects the individual, but it permeates through the church. And so it's important. And then there's the, the deal with Achan's sin, Joshua 7. Where Achan sins by taking the devoted things that is expressly forbidden by God. And, and they go up against Ai and they get defeated and a whole lot of people lose their lives because there's sin in the camp. And so you can understand, as far as they're concerned, if this tribe is sinning and they're worshipping a false god by building another altar to a false god, which is why they affirm they're not, then it needs to be a doubt with. But what's really, really helpful, I think is don't jump to conclusions before you know the facts. They don't go to war. They send a delegation. One from each tribe is because this concerns the whole nation. And the priest, Phineas, goes because he is the spiritual representative. And they go across before they enter into a war so that they can do a fact-finding mission. What is, in fact, going on here? And they confront the tribe, half-tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. They confront them and ask them, what on earth is going on? So that they can get to the bottom of the issue before they take a rash action. Now, let me ask you some questions that are uncomfortable. How many times have you misperceived a situation, drawn wrong conclusions, and acted before getting all the information? I have. I've sometimes perceived a, a situation incorrectly and thoughts have gone through my mind and I've drawn conclusions from it. And I've acted on those conclusions only to discover lately that I, I didn't later that I didn't have all the information available to, to me, and I've had to go back to the people concerned and had to ask for their forgiveness. It's very easy to look at a situation from the outside and to begin perceiving things in your mind as to what really is going on, and then to draw conclusions on your misperceptions, and then to take actions that are consistent with those misperceptions, but that are wrong actions. And so there's a wonderful lesson here, isn't there? Go and deal with the conflict first. Before we begin to judge the actions of people, we need to get to the bottom of why they are doing what they are doing. What is the cause? We need to walk in their shoes. The old story, when you remember of Jesus in John chapter 8, of the woman caught in adultery. In John chapter 8, verse 11 following, where this woman is brought to Jesus. You remember the story. And she's cast at his feet. And they, and, and they say to her, we caught her in the act of adultery because in order for them to actually bring her before Jesus, they had to be looking into where the adultery was occurring and then dragged her out from there and cast at the feet. And Jesus turns to them and says, he is without sin, cast the first stone. 
Very easy to cast stones when we don't have all the information available. And so confrontation is necessary. Now, when we think about confrontation and having to deal with conflict between us or over a particular issue, we mustn't think in terms of having to confront everything. You know, it's, it's not as if every time there is an issue, we should be getting on our high horse and saying, well, it's time to go and confront that person and time to sort it out. Because Peter says in 1 Peter 4 verse 8, love covers over a multitude of sins. So sometimes where there is conflict, we don't always have to deal with it. But what this demonstrates to us is where there is significant conflict, serious conflict, that is going to cause a major disruption in the community. Lives are going to be lost if they follow through with their action. They need to go and first find out what's going on. And the same is true of us as believers. Where there's been a conflict that has caused a serious breach in a relationship, where there has been something that has caused deep hurt, we need to sort it out. And we don't sort it out by going to someone else and gossiping about it. And saying, do you know what so-and-so did to me? Let me tell you. Because that only inflames the situation further. No. We confront. And Matthew, Jesus lays out how we do that. Let me read the verses to you. Jesus gives us a, a method. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have one over your brother. But if he will not listen, take two or three others along so that every matter may be established by two or three witnesses. Now the witnesses who go along with you are not there to corroborate your story. They're not there to support you in the sense of saying, you've done this to X, Y, and Z, and, and, and you, you better ask for forgiveness. They're there to witness that you've done the confrontation. So they're silent witnesses. But they're able to corroborate that you've actually been there and you've tried to deal with the issue. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, then the matter is brought in church. And then it's dealt with at a church level. I'll tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And I tell you, if two or three of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three have come together in my name, there I am with them. Now that is one of the most misunderstood verses in Scripture. How many times have you been to a prayer meeting where someone prays and says, where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are also? That's not the context. It's got nothing to do with prayer meetings. It's got nothing to do with people gathering to pray. It's got to do with conflict. Where two or three are gathered and there's been conflict and they're now praying. What they've bound in heaven is bound, uh, bound on earth is bound in heaven and God is present with them as they're trying to resolve this conflict. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I'll tell you not seven, but 77 times. Do you get the point? Yeah. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we are misunderstood. Sometimes situations arise where harsh words have been exchanged. Emotions have been inflamed. Rational thought has gone out of the window. We may have uttered some very hurtful words that have damaged the person. And now we're sitting in this conflicted situation. The temptation is to go and justify what we've done by telling others and trying to defend our rights. And Scripture says, don't do it. There is a way in which you can resolve this. Go to the person in humility 
sit down and say, let's have a coffee or whatever it is that you drink, tea or milkshake or no coffee. Let's talk through this issue. Let's try and resolve it. Let's bring this conflict to a resolution. So very important. I cannot tell you as a pastor how awfully difficult it is when I'm sitting with two people in a congregation that are in conflict and refuse to talk to each other. It just festers. And it creates great disunity because what sometimes happens is they each go and get their supporters. And now you've not only got two people at conflict, you've got two people plus their supporters. Yeah, confrontation's hard. I know, I have to do it. I have to do one very soon in the future, not because there's a sin or anything like that. And it's hard. But if we love one another, and we are concerned to preserve the unity of the church and the unity of Christ amongst us, then we will do what is necessary to deal with the conflicts that arise among us as these did. C.S. Lewis, that great Christian apologist, C.S. Lewis once wrote, as I stood there that morning to preach on forgiveness, in my own life, I find that to be such a struggle. Thirteen years ago, a dear friend of mine tried to torpedo my ministry. I suspected as much. I confronted him on it, and he confessed that was exactly what he was doing, and asked my forgiveness. I said to him, I forgive you. To this very day, I'm still forgiving him. Yeah, it's hard. I know. It's not pleasant. It can cause your insides to churn at having to do it. But rather than allow ourselves to, call, to let the deep hurt begin to open up into a festering wound, let's deal with it. Sort it out. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're sitting here, and as I've been preaching, God's Spirit has been saying to you, you know that person you're in conflict with. You know who they are. It's time. It's time for you to approach. It's time for you to go to them. It's time for you to just try and sit down and resolve it. They may not want to sit down, there's nothing you can do about it. At least you've tried. But it's time. Thirdly, I want you to notice the resolving of the conflict, verses 21 to 34. They explain why they built the altar. Now, this is a big altar. It's visible. You can see it from a long way. And they simply provide the explanation that they've built the altar in order that it might remain or become a memorial between them and the tribes across the river. Because in the future, when generations come after them, how are they going to know that this, these two and a half tribes on this side of the Jordan, the east side of the Jordan, are part of the tribes on the west side of the Jordan? How are they going to know that? What's going to ensure that conflict war doesn't break out between them? What's going to ensure that they will remain unified as a people and together as a people? Well, it is the sign of this altar that they've built as a memorial symbolizing their unity, symbolizing their togetherness. And so they say, and it's an interesting phrase, God is mighty. And it's repeated, and they say that because what they're trying to say to the other to, uh, ten, uh, or t 10 tribes is that we are worshiping God. We haven't departed from the worship of God. We haven't turned to idolatry as you suppose. We are still worshiping the one and only true God. Yahweh is his name. So you needn't worry about that. This is simply a reminder for us. In other words, their motive for building the altar is pure. 
The intentions are good. And so the other ten tribes recognize and understand that, and they commend them, and they say, this is a good thing. This is a right thing. This is important for us to retain our community together. And can I just say while I'm here that that's why community is so important for the church. That's why I'm meeting together and I'm so pleased to see that you're here this evening. And it's so tremendously encouraging because we are meant to meet together, not online, not, not in front of a TV with a cup of coffee and our feet up on the chair. We are meant to meet together. The unity of God's people is contingent upon their gathering together like this and, and fellowshipping together and serving together and encouraging one another together. That's not done behind a TV screen. It's important for us to retain the sense of oneness and we do that in community together. Not behind a TV screen. I know we've been forced to have to do it behind a TV screen. We understand that. But it should never be a permanent thing. It should only be temporary. And so seeing you here together is wonderfully encouraging because it, it says to me that you understand that. You understand the importance of being together. You know how critical it is that we, we fellowship. Because one of the, the, the things that we do in community is we encourage and support one another, don't we? And we all need encouragement and support. And we're able to do that as we meet together like this and pray for each other. Get alongside those who are struggling. Help the weak and the faint-hearted. And so this disaster is averted. A resolution is found. And the nation is not split down the middle. When we fast forward to the New Testament, Paul, writing to the Ephesians, stresses the importance of the maintenance of the unity of God's people. Jesus in John 17 says you are one already by virtue of the fact that Jesus Christ binds us together as one. Now, as Paul writes, it's not that we try and create unity. We are unified. But it's important that we sustain, we maintain the unity of God's people. And nothing must come into the church as a threat to that unity. And churches have split over people who have disagreed and refused to come together and refused to resolve their conflict. And they've started different churches as a result of those splits. May that never be true of Castle Hill Baptist. Whatever our disagreements are, Whatever our differences of opinion are, however we might view ministry and how ministry ought to be done, where there are the most stringent disagreements, may we always seek to come together and remain and preserve the unity that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do that by talking about those differences, by sitting down together and coming to a solution, even if the reason for that conflict or viewpoints is that we agree to disagree. Nevertheless, we never allow disunity to become part and parcel of our corporate life together. At all costs, we preserve our oneness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when churches split is a terrible way to dishonor the witness of Jesus Christ to the world. We are known, says Jesus, by how we love one another. How can those who love one another end up splitting over disagreements. 
And so there's a tremendous encouragement here as God's people. And thank goodness this church had a split way back in the 70s. That since then it's been a church that has remained together. And so can I encourage you and ask you and plead with you. Pray that God retains and enables us to maintain our unity. And where that unity is under threat or may fracture, pray that God give us the courage to sit down together and find a resolution, even if it is to agree to disagree. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. What a wonderful reminder it is for us as your people to ensure that we don't allow the conflict that sometimes arises in our midst that is inevitable because we are people and we are sinners to cause the unity we have in Christ in any sense to be threatened. Give us the courage to know the difference between when we need to confront and when we need to allow love to cover over a multitude of sins. But where we do need to deal with conflict, we pray that you would encourage us and help us to speak to those with whom we are in conflict with, whatever the conflict may have arisen from. We ask that you would help us as your people to not allow ourselves to form opinions in our minds that are based on false information. Help us always to get to the truth for Jesus' sake. Amen.